Hi people, welcome back to Word Magic and we are going to talk about creating memorable characters today. So before we get started, hit the subscribe button so you get notified when I have new videos out and we will get this underway. For those who don't know me, um, a brief introduction. I am Yasmin Gallinorn. I am a New York Times Publishers Weekly and USA Today bestselling author. And I write paranormal romance and I write urban fantasy and paranormal mystery and a few other things uh, tied in there. Um, I have over 65 books out. I have 23 years experience in the business professionally. 20 of it spent in traditional publishing, mostly with New York, and three of it spent indie. And it looks like Apple may be coming up to join us. Hello, Mr. Apple. Oh, I think he's going to look out the window instead. So yes, creating memorable characters. The first thing I'm going to tell you is that as an author, to create any character or to uh, create any setting, you have to observe. Become a people watcher. Note down characteristics you see. Watch how people walk. Watch how they act. Watch how they act when, nobody, when they think nobody's watching them. Um, listen to how they speak. Listen for unusual pronunciations of words, for accents, for hesitation or forcefulness. Um, learn to constantly be wearing that observer's cap. No matter where I'm at, I'm always keeping an eye open. I'm always listening. I'm always watching. It's just part of my nature as an author and it can help immensely. You have to get out of your own head. You have to be aware of your surroundings. And part of that is becoming a good listener. You learn to step aside and really focus on what the other person is saying or doing. So work on those skills. That's not part of my five tips, but that's just an overall general um, observation on what helps you become a better writer. And that's true, not just of people, but of situations and of settings. Become aware of your surroundings. I suppose that's, the, that's what it all comes down to. You become aware of what's around you. You become aware of their, the smell, the sound, the feel, the, the tactileness. Um, if it's food, the taste, the sounds around you. So open your senses. Work on paying attention to the details. Now for characters, making a believable character, and trust me, I have had so many people comment on how real my characters are, even if they are fae or a vampire or a tree spirit or something, people comment on how real they are. And part of that is because Every character I write will have flaws. Every character is flawed. You cannot create a perfect character who does no wrong, who has no problems, where life is hunky-dory for them constantly, who never has any insecurities, and have people empathize with them. What you are aiming for is to create an empathetic connection between the reader and your character, if it's main, a main character or a secondary character. Preferably they won't be that empathetic with the villain, um, although I do like 
having that nuance in there where the villain has reasons for what they do. I played with that in the Hallowed Hunt a lot. I played with the serial killer um, having some deep set issues for why this was happening, why they were um, killing off people, killing off their, their victims. I'm trying to not give away too many spoilers here. I wanted people to sit there and think, oh wow, doesn't excuse it, but I can see how that could happen. Because villain or hero or heroine alike, all of your characters, regardless of whether they're a vampire or not, regardless of whether they're a shifter or or fae, they must be human at the core for us to respond. Um, so flaws, yes. They make mistakes. Characters always will have problems in their lives, in my books. They will always have some insecurity. They will always make a mistake that hurts others. And hopefully they'll learn from it. Because that's what we do as people. Think outside the stereotypes. The elven princess, the stalwart hero, um, the sexy shifter, you know, those are all stereotypes and that's fine for where you begin, but beneath that you must have layers of personality and layers of um, attributes and qualities that will pull your reader in. Create a stereotype don't give it depth, and you create a boring character. Now, to get information on my characters, I don't sit down. I, I'm not one of those authors who sits down and writes out a list of, okay, I'm going to create this character named Ember Kearney, and she will be this, and she will be part fey, part light fey, part dark fey, and she will be this, and she will be so tall, and she will be this or that. I let the characters grow organically in my mind. Um, I don't even necessarily think about them a lot. I will start the process, and then I'll let my subconscious take over. But when I'm stuck, and you, it used to be when I was writing some of my early, early books, um, I would create this interview process in my head, and I would interview the characters. I would visualize them coming into the room and I would look at what they looked like because every time I tried to force a character to look the way I think or thought I wanted them to it wouldn't work so I would invite them into the room and they would walk in the room and I would see how they looked I would make notes on what color their hair was what color their eyes were I would listen to how their voice sounded I would listen to speech patterns and I would ask them questions. I would ask them, so tell me, what was your worst nightmare when you were a child? And I would listen and I would wait and they would tell me. Interviewing your characters is an incredibly powerful way to connect with them. Now, don't be alarmed if you try this and the first few times it doesn't work because your mind is getting used to this process. You have to train your mind in new exercises for it to work. So try this several times and pretty soon your mind will get the hang of what you're trying it to do, what you're asking it to do. The characters need to grow through the series um, or through the book. There must be some character growth for your main character between page one and the words at the end. We grow as people all the time, or at least I would hope we do. When you stop growing, you stop thriving.
thriving. When you stop growing, when you stop learning, um, you stagnate. So make sure that throughout the story that you put your character through, that they grow from that, that they learn from their mistakes. Let them make mistakes too. It's okay for a character to make a mistake and hopefully they'll learn from it. And that is something that will appeal to your reader is watching your character grow throughout the book. Sorry, I have a scratchy throat today from pollen in the air, so um, I'm having to stop now and then to take a drink of water <clears throat> to clear my throat. When I started with, uh, let's use Otherworld for an example, because most of my readers are most familiar with that series. When I first started with Camille, she was, she had been afraid because of the relationship with Trillian. She was afraid to get in another relationship, but she was a passionate character and I knew that she could not be celibate, she could not be monogamous. That's not her nature. So as Smokey and Morio and Trillian came into the picture again. Um, I realized she was going to have to learn how to deal with relationships as a whole and multiple relationships because again she is not a monogamous person. She's polyamorous and it's not that she is promiscuous but she she finds her love expands to more than one person. Um, so I was working with that concept for her. For Delilah, Delilah ticked me off. I'll tell you, Delilah, I had the hardest time writing Delilah's books all the way through the series. Delilah hid from me. Delilah didn't want to give me any thing. Delilah ticked me off because she was so naive at the beginning. But that's what she was. So I had to write her the way she was. And frankly, there were times I was just like groaning when I came to writing Delilah's books. I don't want to do this. you know. <laughs> not because I didn't love the series, not because I didn't like Delilah, but, but she was an annoying pain in the ass at times. But I noticed her beginning to grow. And she really grew to the point where I actually enjoyed writing her last few books. You know, she, it, was, it was exciting to see her go out of that naive, over-gullible young woman into a confident, strong woman who understood that life wasn't black and white, that life had so many shades of gray in it. So that was that was exciting. And mentally, watching her grow from the incredibly hurt, so she built barriers around her um, person that she started out, to someone who could open up to love and let it into her life and realize that she was worth loving. Watching her grow actually was emotionally gratifying to me. Uh, so yeah, all three of the sisters had their own evolutionary path through the series. And they were hurt. There were times they were incredibly hurt when Haito hurt Camille. Um, it was difficult for me to make the choice to allow him to do that to her. Because I don't like using that as a trope. I don't like using assault as 
a gimmick and I won't. It's as brutal as it really is. And I have been raped and I have been um, hurt in the past like that. I've been through domestic violence. So I wanted, when I realized that that's the way the story was moving and there was no way to pull any punches without making the story less than real, I decided I would I would make it as brutal as it really is because there's no way I will ever romanticize assault. Um, and Camille came out of it. She was strong going into it and she came out of it stronger only because that's the way you survive. That's the way you survive assault. It's, you may be strong going in, but to get out of it, you have to reach inside and grab that core of yourself and go, I will not let this core of myself be hurt. They may hurt my body. They may hurt, you know, hurt, you know, all parts of me, but they will never touch that core that's inside. And I guess with Menelie, when Dredge turned her, that's what I did for her too, but she she hadn't yet reached in and, and let that core of herself explore being loved again. Um, she still had the barricades up because she was still terrified of letting anybody in. So look at your characters. Find their strengths. Find their weaknesses. When we face our weaknesses is when we grow. When we face our fears is when we grow. So your characters need to face fears. They need to face challenges in order to come through and be a stronger person. <clears throat> um, one thing, I, I cannot read series where the character never changes where the character never grows, where the character never learns, where the character never has to really face our choice in life. And that can be the choice of loving. It can be the choice of letting go of love. It can be the choice of battling an evil that you are afraid to face. It can be the choice of facing the fact that if you love someone, you may lose them. Um, Characters who never have to make those decisions bore me. So that's why my characters often face harm and hurt and they get beat up and they get dragged through the mud and they come back the stronger for it. Now, if I wasn't writing urban fantasy, it might be a totally different um, playing field in what challenges they face. Obviously, there's a lot of action in my books. So yeah, Mike. Thank you, Kaylee. Kaylee just brought mommy a toy, and she did a good job, and she picked the best toy ever. Oh, what a good girl. Kaylee's a good girl. She likes that. Yeah, Kaylee's a good girl. <laughs> And she's coming over here. Anyway, if I if I wrote more straight, more um, romance, where that was the main story, the traumas would be different. The challenges would be different. Urban fantasy, the challenges tend to be more physical, more. Um, what monster are they going to face and what fears are they facing with those monsters? And what fears do facing the enemy bring up? Um, the fear of not being good enough, of not being strong enough. Uh, we're playing with that in Ember stories a lot. Her in The Silver Mist, which I just finished writing today and I will be getting off to my editor in a week or so. Um, 
Ember has to face what she's willing to do when necessary on an ethical level. And she has to face that sometimes, sometimes what we think we couldn't do, we have to do. So, I suppose what it all comes down to is making your characters come alive. No, don't shake the camera. Making your characters come alive, making them... You were saying? Siri think I ju thinks I just asked it something because Kaylee sucked on it on my phone um, <laughs> where was I give me a moment okay we bring our characters to life by making them well-rounded by thinking outside the stereotypes by letting them grow through the book by letting them make mistakes and learn from those mistakes by looking at them as a well-rounded individual. Characters, you can't just have the trope of the hero, the heroine, the sidekick, and the villain. Those characters are all complex beings. Maybe the villain likes to knit. I mean, look, in Bewitching Bedlam, I've got a vampire, hot rock star type guy, who loves to do puzzles, bake, and he loves kittens. That's more well-rounded, you know. It's like we all have complex personalities. We all have many facets. So should our characters. So I think that's going to be about it for today. But go and observe. And when you are writing, when you are working with a character, stop and ask yourself, have I given them enough levels? Have I, like in Shrek, you know, Life's like an onion. People are like onions. We have many layers um, before you get to the core. In fact, years and years ago, I was in a play uh, called, what was it? I can't remember. It was so many years back. Anyway, I was in a play, and one of my lines was, Life is like an onion. The more you peel it, the closer you get to the center. I played Roxanne Gunk, um, a hippy dippy type. So, yeah, that was different than my nature. Anyway, <laughs> I think I'm starting to ramble. And uh, I think I'll tie this up by just saying, as an exercise, this next week, observe people. Keep a notebook. Write down little things that you notice. The way a person may hold their hands, the way they may talk to animals when they think nobody's looking, the way they may sit and think. Maybe they stare into space. Maybe they close their eyes. Maybe they look pensive. Pay attention. Watch. Observe. Learn. And I will probably see you next week in another video. Leave comments and questions below. I will do my best to get to some of them. And by the way, a lot of people have commented on my tattoos. My many, many tattoos. And you aren't even seeing all of them here by any means. Um, they've asked about them. So, a very, very brief note. All my tattoos are spiritual in origin. They all have something to do with my magic and my spirituality and my path as a pagan priestess. Whether it's connected with my animal spirits, whether it's connected with um, the fae, the wrong side, uh, that's a fae queen. Whether it's connected with, oh, the... The winged axe is connected with two of the gods I follow. Because the butterfly is a messenger from one of them. And they both wield axes. They're both, one's a forest god, one is a sky god. So yeah, all of my tattoos 
are spiritually based. I have no one's name tattooed on me. I never will. Uh, the only faces I have tattooed on me are animals and the, the fae. I still am not getting the hang of which direction is which when I stare at the camera here. <laughs> um, I do plan on more tattoos. I haven't gotten any for a while as to how many I have. I don't know. I've gotten so many that I can't quite remember. Let me see. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I have at least, at least 15 tattoos. I have over 100 hours in the chair, put it that way. So there are answers to that question. And I will talk to you next week. Have a wonderful week. The Hallowed Hunt is out. You can find the links below. I have a special running on Murder of a, on a Mystic Moon. Um, it is for free for the next limited month or so. I will put the links down below. And other than that, uh, I'll talk to you later.